Ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished scholars of non-binary gender, this is the CSUS Gorilla Philosophy Club. I am Daniel, your club's nominal treasurer. With me, as always, is the club's nominal presence, some wonderful William Wyatt, leading us through the through the challenges here. And our distinguished members, welcome to a most unusual meeting where we had um. Professor Miriam, who was going to come talk about thought experiments, but unfortunately is sick. And so we um, are going to sort of talk about something else. Yes. We don't quite know yet because I only find out, found out that he had to cancel like five minutes ago because he, he, he wants to stick through and he emailed me this afternoon. I only just had, so this is entirely on me. And so I have something that I've sort of been floating around. I've got my senior essay due for philosophy and I can sort of talk about ideas like that pertaining to um, pertaining to the categoricity of morality. But in truth, I would, um, I mean, like I've, I've talked with William a lot. I, so I sort of know that, but I would sort of like to see um, um, Diana and Blake, since you are newer to the philosophy club, what sort of interest do, you, do y'all have in philosophy? Yes. The whole world's mm. watching. <laughs> All right. No pressure. Interest in philosophy. Well, I think the uh, main interest is just uh, trying to figure out um, what matters and, and what doesn't. Um, because there's been a lot of things that I've, I've, I feel like I've learned things that uh, eh, don't really matter when you look at it. And it's like, well, that's great. That's applicable to that thing. And so wanting to figure out, well, this is, this is really, this is really learning something. And so I think that's what philosophy uh, really gains or gives everyone that's, uh, that takes part in it. Okay. Certainly a subject I would have a lot to say about uh, personally as well, but uh, okay, uh, that and Diana. Um, um, there's lots of things that I like about philosophy. Um, initially what, kind of drew me in was the fact of how uh, the different the type of learning was from different classes that I've had. Um, obviously, I well, in my opinion, a lot of the classes available are very um, descriptive, you know, um, very much so memorize this information, regurgitate it, and then you get an A. Whereas in philosophy, I feel like it's a lot of normative thinking. Um, and we talk about how things should be, um, and which is subjective for everybody. Um, but it's just a lot more um, provocative in thought, which I definitely appreciate. And it doesn't bore me <laughs> how uh, other classes, uh, you know, just perceive with a descriptive type of learning. Um, and so uh, there's lots of topics that I enjoy. I really like um, anything to do with existentialism, um, epistemology. Um, I also really like philosophy of mind. Um, uh, there's probably, there's not a subject or branch of philosophy that I've met that I haven't liked. Um, and particularly, uh, talking about numbers too, if they're real or if we're real or et cetera. But there's just a quite a large variety of things that, that I like and appreciate about philosophy. Likewise, likewise. William, I didn't mean that you could also not answer the question. Um, what, what, um, what sort of draws you to philosophy or where your interests lie or things of that nature? Oh gosh, for me, it's pretty much all ethics all the time. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's one of those like I'm I'm really fascinated and but I, but I came to be fascinated by philosophy as like the uncompartmentalized academic field. It is it is the field from which all the other like disciplines uh, of of the intelligentsia have cascaded over centuries, right? So you start out with you know mona uh, uh, yeah like monist philosophers uh, in the ancient Mediterranean and. They first developed the idea of thinking about stuff, and then that, you know, developed into uh, sub branches of philosophy, um, which eventually became the arts and sciences, and then like the subcategories of the sciences, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, so, like, 
I, I to identify like a subject interest area in philosophy for me is 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 subjectively quite strange. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I'm most concerned I think with like ameliorative and and emancipatory philosophical approaches where the priority at the outset is to make sense of stuff and our experiences of that of that stuff in such a way as increases our like security and well being uh, in effect, right? which sometimes is just understanding a thing in a particular way, but mostly has like direct political uh, implications. So for example, if like, if we, if we come away, uh, if we approach gender philosophically, as the odds are pretty good that we're gonna come away with an understanding that demands we do something different with our public policy uh, than we do right now. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing in, in philosophy that, that really keeps me here, keeps me doing this kind of thing, because it is, I mean, I, I, I make trying to fix this broken machine of ours is what drew me in, uh, what, what drew me to, to academia in the first place at all, uh, like post-secondary education. Um, so yeah, like not to, not to ramble or anything, but I'm, I'm definitely on, on the uh, ethics end of philosophy, but with that, with the understanding, with the big old caveat that like, that doesn't, that isn't like a limiting factor, I don't, I don't think. Um, on, on the kinds of things that I'm willing to like spend my time discussing, you know? I, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get you. By the way, welcome Justin. Professor yeah, Miriam is sick. So he had to postpone his appearance. So we're just sort of freelancers and sort of working our way in sort of a round table discussion about sort of philosophy or whatever issues sort of be on, on the mind. Um, I guess sort of, answer my own question of sort of what what drew me drew me into to philosophy um or, or what i what i like about it i i like william tend to really like go at least, at least historically like really all like almost exclusively gone on to ethics but i do i do sort of like like the interaction of sort of epistemology and ethics um you know epistemic virtues sort of the 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 moral weight of kind of examining information appropriately, um, what is and is not a legitimate epistemic sort of source and, you know, the implications for that and sort of blameworthiness of it. I've always kind of been fascinated about the relationship between faith and reason. Um, so that's sort of always been there. But what sort of draws me as uh, the, into the, the field more broadly or keeping around is that like, it really is so broad and so many different like interests like Diana you mentioned um like liking you know sort of like 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 our numbers real and I'm just like I I am envious of people who can get in those because like I cannot force myself to have an opinion <laughs> I can sit here and argue about sort of you know some niche ethical theory that will make someone else go who the hell cares but it, it's fascinating it, it, it's sort of what what it defines philosophy is that it, it's got it's got something for everyone um justin did you want to chime in and um say sort of what what draws you into philosophy honestly i'm like in the middle of dinner right now i thought i was <laughs> gonna be listening to miriam for a while so no not right now but i'll, I'll catch up with you in a bit that is okay yeah we hope we, we will be at least a fraction as insightful as professor miriam talking about thought experiments now, Daniel, do you think you can make an argument for one side or the other on uh, whether or not numbers are real? I just, like, <laughs> I can't even, like, force myself to get, like, worked up enough to sort of, like, relate to a theory one way or the other. Why do you have trouble um, with with numbers particularly? Is it because it's uh, abstract? Um, I... I mean, maybe it's just kind of my, like one of my default sort of examples or, or, or go-to things. And um, just uh, just thought it was interesting that Diana brought brought it up too. The other one I sort of go to is is, is like bundle theory in metaphysics. It's just like, it, 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 that's, it's something I would say in epistemology all the time. It's just like the, the, the world does not end one way or another, whether or not bundle theory is real. Um, but, you know, one might argue that the world does not end one way or the other, whether or not emotivism is is true or not. It's not. It's the best of all the non-cognitivist positions, 
but it's it it's not true. But I've I, I I've I've rambled enough about my about my fixations. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, okay, so we haven't come away with like a topic to direct the rest of our conversation. We can keep it in this sort of uncompartmentalized, uh, you know, un, uh, undirected form. But maybe uh, I, I think it prudent to like settle on something to, to, uh, yeah, to drive us forward, um, topic wise. So, um, I mean, yeah, we, too- we could certainly go off on numbers, right? Um, if we wanted to. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, actually, I think I have an opinion, but it's not super well formed. Um, Ooh, oh, you, you know what? Okay, I yeah. I'm curious now. I want to hear. Um, all right, Eric T. Olson, animalism. animalism. Animalism is good. I'm not as familiar as I would like to be. I think I've read one paper on it. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to. Metaphysics was a while ago. That's that's the. We're a thinking animal, right? I think. I think yeah, so, yeah. Animalism says that, um, you know, that we that we are human animals, and that um, it argues that if we don't accept it, then we face kind of like an awkward choice where we must either deny that we are human animals or deny that human animals can think or deny that we are the thinking things located where we are. So that's okay. what animalism says. Okay. Well, according to Eric T. Olson on uh, his argument for it. Uh, what, do, what, what do you think about it? I don't, I don't think that we are entirely animals. I think that there is a portion of us that is beyond um, sort of like this physical realm and that whether that be the mind or the soul or whatever however you want to define that um i think that there is certainly more to us than that because just our mind or brain alone is kind of acts as a a radio in a way that it picks up certain frequencies and vibrations and whatnot and so i don't think that we are entirely animals in that sense and we also practice and exercise our own autonomy as well and if we do choose or we do accept that we are animals and we also face another choice that then we are kind of forced to accept um certain gender uh constructs as well just because then, you know, we can't identify how we wish or would like to, um, but instead we're just kind of forced into like two categories, in my opinion, so. That, that is an interesting question. I'm a, I'm a think, a, think a little more, if anyone else has any sort of jump off thoughts there, but the, I, I, I'm not sure that I, agree that we couldn't um that, that we couldn't both uh, be um animals and self identify in particular ways and sort of correct these the, these sorts of of things um but it it it, it is interesting if we sort of like you know, the, the the really the really simplistic standard line of thought that like sex is biological gender is social that sort of thing it would um i mean like there are social animals but when we mean social in that sense we do we 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 mean something a little more sort of like constructed and synthetic and that would seem to sort of go away if we were if we were animals maybe so i I'd, I'd, I'd have to i'd have to think on that more um any anyone else want to chime in while i while i think on that more stew over stew over some things here well, they have to be connected in some place, right? Like, like they have to, your mind and body, say your body is the animal, right? Um, they have to be connected at some point because we're able to move it and, you know, make it dance around. And so I, I feel that like, yeah, there may be something, I was having a conversation, I think today or yesterday about how fast uh, neurons fire. 
and how the speed of that is incredibly slower than the speed of light. And so that the light packets as we're going in and our brain is thinking about those things, there's no way that they could happen at the same frequency. And so if you're looking at that from a, um, simply a, like a mind body, um, I, I think that there's this bit where we can say, yeah, maybe they don't exist in the same realm and the same, you know, everything's in the same area, but they do interact, at least in this realm that we see that I'm able to think and I'm able to control this. I'm able to manipulate things in this world, um, but maybe it doesn't all fully kind of happen in this realm. If that affects, um, you know, our, our, able, uh, our ability to express things like gender, um, there may be something that uh, that mind is detached or in the realm where it is more prevalent, that it is detached from gender fully, where it's just that your consciousness is has nothing to do with what is uh, corporal. Yeah. yeah. I think corporeal is what you're doing for uh, on the last bit, but like, that's not a challenge. I say just, uh, corporal. Corporal. <laughs> As corporal. in corporal punishment? <laughs> yes. Corporeal. The corporeal punishment club. Uh, <laughs> corporeal punishment. I find myself with a lot, but uh, the um, one of the things that I want to interrogate a bit on the topic of analytics. First of all, thank you for bringing it up. I think this is the topic. I think this is the one. Yes. Um, <laughs> but thank there's... you for coming, Diana, and rescuing this meeting. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I think uh, some of, of, the, of the argument against uh, animalism that I have heard so far, and, and to be clear about where I'm coming from here, I, I remember, I think I read Olson's paper and and took away from it like how you know this is this is uh this argument for for animalism uh is like true but uninteresting just in that yeah obviously we're animals because we live in a material universe we're biological things which we taxonomically classify as animals there's not there's not like an interesting relation here but you're bringing in something else uh which is like the implication that if we are uh animals there's there's some sense in which we are merely animals, and that's what I want to challenge. Like I don't, I, I think we come, I think we can uh, develop through like watching the non-human animals that we're familiar with. The idea that like animals are are simpler than humans or are like um, uh, incapable of like reason and politics and, and these sorts of things at some like fundamental level that we are separate from or transcend in some some way. And if you have like a non-material premise somewhere in there, you can make that case. But like, I don't have that available. So I have to think this way. Uh, the, where at least I, I assume there's some like non-material premise. I mean, uh, yeah, to correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong on that. But uh, I, I think that is uh, th that, that impression of like what animals are capable of and therefore humans can't be them is, uh, or that humans must, you know, are, are more because we're capable of more um, is mistaken in that, animals are fantastically complicated. Like there's no, we are, uh, you know, if we are animals, we are certainly like interesting ones. Uh, maybe we find ourselves to be more interesting than we find like other animals. But I don't think that's really a limit on what we are or can be. Um, oh, we have someone else coming in. Um, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, I, I think my impression is like the, re the rejection of animalism, which, which again, I take to be like trivially true uh, on like basic biological premises uh, is, is just, is just too limited an idea of what, of what an animal is or what an animal can, can be or can do. Um, absent again, like a non-material premise, I, I can't make that case for myself. Um, so I'm wondering, would you like, to, I want, that's what I kind of want to interrogate is like, that is that, Am I right thinking that that's like the source of the of the objection primarily or something deeper? Um, I think that I do agree that, you know, we are animals. I just don't think that that's 
our entirety. I think that there's a deg another degree to us that is non-material. And um, I kind of put the example of like our minds being like this energy field that can, you know, uh, pick up frequencies and certain vibrations. But actually, I was actually just thinking, I remembered um, the other day I was uh, taking a walk and this ladybug landed on me and I got the curiosity to Google what do ladybugs eat and I and I googled it and it said that it, they eat aphids um, and I was reading a little bit more on aphids and they are actually like this um, like female in, insect that reproduce um, themselves without the help of a male insect but rather when they give birth to other insects or more insects um, the insects themselves are already pregnant, if that makes sense. So um, that's how they kind of just reproduce in that sense. And then also um, we have uh, the seahorse, right? The male seahorse or whatever carries the actual um, baby seahorse. <laughs> I was going to say child, but that doesn't really make sense. But um, so there are examples in nature where certain constructs are not followed or are not, um, don't fall into the necessary like uh, cookie cutter template that we see today. And so that, that's also another interesting um, objection there is that not always in nature as well do we have these sort of black and white um, categories about, you know, gender as we have seen in nature. I, I think I figured out, I think I figured out my position rel relative to, to, to things. And I think it goes back to, to your initial concern being right. Um, like the sort of rather fine grain, for lack of a better way to put it, categories. I just like, I don't think other animals are capable of of that like like we know homosexuality exists in nature i don't think like i don't think a panther can be demisexual i like like I, i'm not trying to, to to be funny here like 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 that's like not a a thing i don't know that i i don't know that uh koala um understands the difference between pansexual and bisexual um relative to to gender i don't think a horse can discover oh i'm non-binary i just don't i just don't think that that I, I mean not 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 trying to disparage like like animal animals are psychologically more capable than we thought they were a, a, a good a good number of them we have research about ones that you know when you put a smudge on the on on a mirror and they go and look at themselves they'll try to find the smudge on themselves um because they they they're like oh that's me they have they have self-reflection certain animals but i don't i don't know that they have sort of a gender identity in this sort of more robust more fine-grained way that we have it and so i think that if animalism is right that you know us being animals is in some way at least a factor or a portion of our identity then that means the sort of more basic concept of biological sex or genitalia is then tied into our identity and we do wind up losing all these sort of rich and i think very legitimate ways of sort of self-identifying and parsing out the world and that people are so i very long-winded way of saying i think you're right diana <laughs> uh, okay but um, if anyone if, if anyone else wants any needs any wants to give any pushback or anything like obviously i don't mean that like that's it we've solved it that's the end of it daniel hath declared um, a thing that I will say, I, I, it sounds like the salient question here is, are human beings, I guess, 
is any human being capable of, of something that necessitates, that can only be done uh, if there is a, a greater than or non-animal like aspect to human beings, right? Like, do we have capacities? Do we have tendencies? Do we have capabilities which are uh, impossible for an animal to achieve, necessitating that we be something else, something uh, in addition to animals? Am I am I getting the, the am I getting at the question correctly? First of all, um, I I, I certainly certainly, <laughs> certainly close. I don't I don't know that I'm like. In a sense, I'm referring to the capabilities, but more more particularly, I am prefer I am referring to the particular identities that sort of come about of these of these capabilities. Mm. A a I'm 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 running out of examples. A uh, uh, fucking why can't why why can't I think of an animal? A a dog cannot be gender queer. Can we say that uh, those identities are um, relation to activities of that animal? How uh, explain a little bit more? So it is um, if you think about like uh, humans currently versus humans fifty years ago, there's a considerably different. Um, uh, like a prominence to the activities of anything that's non-heterosexual um, because it was shunned. And so it's something that it's, it's the, um, there's a social dynamic that is limiting there. And if there's a social dynamic that is limiting in snails so that snails don't enact a certain um, identification of any sort, um, there may not be demisexual snails because their society of snails has said no 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 we're gonna believe in something that says that that's just not the way like we've experienced it in humans so why can't we experience that in seahorses and whatever else that in 75 years they may be completely different or they may like want something absolutely different than what they are today and we'd have to accept that's always been a part of it I, okay, I, okay, I, the, the, my, is the echo coming on my end? Oh, am I echoey? Uh, you were for a second, but I, I, it stops for most of the time. I think, I think Zoom calibrates, like, part way through. Let me uh, get some headphones. You speak. <laughs> okay, I just want to make headphones. sure that my terrifying voice is not coming to destroy the, the cosmos, um, but the, <laughs> Um, I, I guess to, to that end, um, what I would call kind of the more distinct capacity then is sort of not sort of changing behaviors, but sort of like grouping of traits and behaviors as being distinct of particular identities that are not biological sex. Another question that I was uh, thinking about right now, too, is that are we even capable of understanding if whether or not animals do have this ability to identify as something other than what we think of them? And in a sense, that also may be that we're doing, maybe not on purpose, but an epistemic injustice to them because we don't even have really the capability to number one, understand, ask them, um, and thus maybe even uh, counter or or leave out any type of knowledge that may they may have on their own simply because we can't understand it. I I had thought of something similar as well. Like um, we yeah you I, I think you're right. Like we don't. Uh, even, even when we try, we, we tend not to be able to access these sort of identities of various uh, non-human animals, I guess. Um, so like for, I don't know, would it even make sense to like, to, to interrogate a seahorse's gender, assuming <laughs> it has one? Like, 
would those cat would that category system, uh, system to which they may or may not conform uh, even remotely resemble or be intelligible to the the hermeneutic that we are working with? Um, I suspect not. <laughs> I think I I I would sus I suspect it would be very different, assuming they have these like that that richness of complexity of experiences. But on the other side, like what the you brought in earlier, uh, Diana, the the diff like the the various kind the various ways in which animals achieve sexual or non sexual reproduction, uh, being, uh, you know, throwing off our, our ability to like categorize them sexually easily. Like, yeah, so you know, anatomically we can see like which one has the which set of creatures has the gametes of which like sex, right? Uh, the actual sort of behavior, the actual habits, etc., place aphids as parthenogenic females and parthenogenesis being the process of reproducing basically through cloning. Um, and, 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 and obviously seahorses uh, achieve sexual reproduction, but by like OB position, so, so on and so forth. Um, what I want to make sure I, I commit to the record for myself is that that doesn't have like relevance to whether we are that, we are like them in the, in the, relevant, in the salient sense. Um, at least I don't think so. Just because we happen to have the sort of, I mean, they're not even sexual categories. I, I, I think it's because of the existence of, of, of people uh, with various like uh, so-called intersex anatomies. I, the, uh, it, isn't, it isn't quite a binary system, even for human and even on a strictly like anatomical level. But uh, even just because like animals don't, uh, non-human animals don't, usually conform or don't always conform to that kind of thing. Oh, you know what I just thought of? Sex changing fish. There's plenty of those. Um, really throws us off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean that they can't have a, a, a richness of experience of, you know, sex and gender and stuff. I mean, as far as we can tell, like, you know, the, the sort of great ape family of, of, of creatures. I think this is true scientifically, but, but evidence may show that I'm wrong. I think as far as we know, we, uh, the, the, the great ape family, uh, family, maybe not, uh, is the only set of, of creatures in the world who like have sex for fun. Like we do, you know, we and like chimps, etc. do recreational sex. And that, that is all of the species that do it. Um, dolphins, Dolphins are said to have had recreational sex. Just throwing oh. that out there. <laughs> yeah. Which is to say that, like, that was a good addition. It's it's not know. unprecedented in in like what I call it the the rest of the animal kingdom. Um, um, by the way, have, I, I have that kind of that that kind of experience of sex. Uh, but then we talk about identity. So I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll let Dana go. Yeah. I I done I done looked it up, William. Um, they are a the, the great apes are a family Sweet. in taxonomy. So there there you go. That that's all my contribution. Okay, cool. <laughs> but yeah, like as, as again as 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 you said, Anna, we can't necessarily access their uh, animals' experiences of identities um, and their abilities. You, you mentioned as well, like. The, the non-material like aspects of the mind. And I say that like, I believe you. Um, <laughs> like, say, say more about that. Cause that's like, that's another sort of uh, thing in the, in the realm of like capacities that, that we have that, that uh, if, I'm gather if I'm gathering you correctly, if, if, like uh, evidences that we can't be mere animal creatures, that we can't be merely like physical, biological things. So what- um yeah. I would just speak a little bit more about like the sort of energy and how we are all just energy and how like like we were talking about uh, earlier how we are in this, you know, or the forms essentially um, on this 3D dimensional plane and we're all like material right now, yes, but essentially um we are all just energy. I mean, uh, even if we look at um, Einstein's um, famous, equa famous equation about E equals MC squared, that literally means energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And so it's, it's us energy, we, yes, we are mass, but 
essentially that's what we boil down to is just energy. So for me to say that we are only animals is not entirely true because there is a percentage of us that is energy. Yes, we are represented perhaps materially um, on this plane and maybe on this dimension, but there is more to us um, just uh, energy and and I and I kind of I, I could tie in a little bit more about like this like strange peculiar theory that I have to like about the scriptures or whatever um, any religion really or I'm most more so talking about um, specifically like um, Christianity and uh, and how that book alone about how Jesus was able to do certain things like water into wine um, and had different abilities to like walk on water, et cetera. Like I could even theorize that as humans, we are able to do and have certain um, abilities to do different things like um, telepathy, et cetera. And that, that was just perhaps like a, um, a guide as to say this is what we're possibly capable of um as humans and and that we can do things that transcend beyond our material uh capability um we are like i said that our mind is kind of like a receiver of information like a radio picking up signals and in that same way like when we know how to develop the ability to um, be, for example, telepathic and, and, and pick up someone's energy or what they want to say. Essentially, that's what we're doing is just uh, picking up on those waves, on those frequencies that you can't really put a grasp on materially. Um, and so, uh, if, like I said, if we accept that we are entirely animals, then then we kind of leave out this part of us that is still relevant to us. I, I, have I, a, know, I threw a lot there. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, it's 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 good though. I I have sort of a a, a couple thoughts. One more immediately relevant to this. One I just sort of want to put out there in the ether and we can get to a sort of what whatever and the the first is that like i i as a as a religious person i i too have been you know kind of fascinated by the idea more generally of miracles as unexplained science for lack of a better way to put it or like just a sort of unexplained physics or what whatever whatever else have you i don't i don't know quite fully that I'm all the way there because I'm also sort of you know sympathetic to the notion of sort of like miracles as sort of like allegory it's you know about sort of the lessons you take away from them and you know that that that's that sort of thing it, it's more of a sim symbolic lesson too but that that's neither here nor there um the like the the second thing the more generally to the to the topic and I just want to point out there is that like like the before before the discussion that they that you brought on the thing that made me hesitant to accept animalism is that like I have the goal of one day putting myself in a robot body so we can really truly solve the ship of Theseus problem <laughs> um, and if animalism is true <laughs> I'm I'm not going to be able to do that William this is not a joke this is a genuine goal that I have in my life then I really I do have terrible news. <laughs> I, I really, I really, really want to put myself in a robot body just to, to really assess this. And and I absolutely want someone to see if they can jumpstart the fleshy star. We can have flesh Daniel and robot Daniel. It'll be fantastic. And, and, and flesh Daniel and robot Daniel will philosophically debate about who the real Daniel is until robot Daniel gets mad and punches flesh Daniel in the face like someone should have done years ago. That's neither here, here nor there. But if animalism is true, I'm not going to be able to do that because robot Daniel won't be robot Daniel. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's actually quite fascinating. True. It'll just be a, it'll be a different, a different thing. It, it'll be like a can, really, really good like approximation of Daniel. Because it would be like just if only by virtue of being a different like implementation of the same algorithms and therefore the same functions. I I I appreciate that. Um, that's a that's a Mike Tyson quote, right, Justin? <laughs> I say the thing sometimes about like no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's you, what that that's better. <laughs> the thing I, you can't. I'm pointing uh, that's, at this, that's 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 an that's an Iron Mike quote. Believe okay, it. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> We could do an entire meeting on just the philosophical implications of Mike Tyson quotes. Here's a good one for you. I'll fight any man, any animal. If <laughs> Jesus were here, I'd fight him too. Oof. I have I have spent years pondering this quote. That's neither here nor there. So Mike Tyson, like non-animalist, uh, uh, he's he's come out of the he's come out of the closet on that one. <laughs> and also, I'm pretty sure he he died. Did he wait? No, no, Mike Tyson. Definitely not dead. Jesus okay, cool. Not dead. <laughs> Who am I thinking? Mohammed Ali. That's okay. Never mind. I don't know boxers uh, super well. <laughs> For we only know reasons more. that will be obvious if you ever like see my body uh, and what it looks like. Um, uh, in terms of temperament, William, you probably could not have picked two further apart individuals. Maybe not. Wait, am I thinking of? Does, does Mike Tyson have like a, a, a crazy like tattoo like on his face? Okay. Yup. That is, okay, cool. Um, neither here nor there. It, 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 uh, uh, I think would probably also be a non-animalist given his religious inclinations. Um, okay, let me say a thing about materialism because I am a strict materialist, but here's, but it's important I think that I, that I come out of the gates saying what that means for me. Um, and and, and it, it comes in the form of like a cautionary tale about Einstein. What his general relativity theory expressed partly in the equation e, e, e equals mc squared is not that there is like matter and also energy. It's that these are the same things implemented in different ways. We experience them differently, but that's, we are, we are making a mistake by dividing them up. Um, we talk about like, matter in terms of its mass, its gravity, et cetera. Um, but what he showed, what he found out and what was demonstrated experimentally over, over, many, over time, we make a mistake by the way, if we attribute everything to Einstein, uh, he, he did a paradigm shift, but like not by himself. Uh, anyway, what he was expressing there is that all of the things, everything in the universe is material and it is energy at the same time. Um, and we can, physics is 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 uh, unlimbered of delusions when we understand them as being the same thing uh, in different like forms sort of in the same way that like water has several states of matter including uh, steam salt ice water liquid water and like I don't know if you heat it up enough plasma but then at that point is there even water anymore because like this stuff anyway it is also true for example that like and we can sort of understand this Newtonian, but it, we're, it's better understood under, under general relativity that anything that we can touch, you know, subjectively, I guess, um, is mostly empty space by virtue of the fact that it's uh, a very small neutron surrounded by an electron cloud which repels other electron clouds. And that's the thing that we're touching. Um, so on and so forth. Like it's, there's a very long conversation about physics to be had, but all basically to the effect that everything is material and energy these are these are these are just not separate things in physical terms Mathema uh, mathematically or practically because we can do we can do work with this theory understand with this understanding in mind um, including but not limited to like nuclear fission uh, to generate electricity etc um, so that's what I will say like materialism is not for is not limited to talking about like stuff that has apparent mass. Uh, it is, it is a, 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 a philosophical like bent or, or, or uh, you know, umbrella theory that allows for, um, well, it, I mean, it really just is, it is physics. <laughs> I guess, uh, physics is, is, is by necessity materialist. Um, and what that means is like a non-material position 
including but not limited to like faith-based ones will disagree with it in some part or at least in some like base assumption physics uh, 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 yeah necessitates like naturalism or makes that assumption like a priori um whereas like a, a you know religious doctrines don't make that same assumption so they come away with different ideas anyway so that's like I, I take that to be a worthy thing to say about materialism that it includes energy insofar as like energy is the capacity to do work etc it's just like a way of representing um the physical stuff that we that we can observe uh experimentally and mathematically um and 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 so for that for that reason like yeah we can we we do things like we receive energy human beings right but like it's not not material <laughs> um light for example doesn't seem to have doesn't have like mass but it is definitely material stuff insofar as it can be understood physically uh or at least it, we can we can do a lot of theorizing about it phys in, in physics that allows us to create lasers and so uh, uh so and really that's once you're creating wanna, what lasers what that's important like, that's what's important was once you're creating lasers well yeah that's obviously like the goal of all philosophy <laughs> to create the most powerful laser uh, um, we we could do this with all with all things metaphysics you know what exists in the world that we need to create lasers um epistemology do we know enough about what lasers are in order to create them ethics is it ethical to make sharks with freaking lasers on their heads it's all about lasers in the end <laughs> it's going to be what uh, professor miriam talks about Thought experiments should always take the form of lasers. Um, okay, so anyway, that's uh, yeah, the, the the equivalence of of material stuff mc squared um, plus and and energy e is just it's not non materialistic is what I is what I mean to entail. Every animal deserves. You left something out, Justin. Every animal deserves a warm meal and a laser. Uh, <laughs> which that was that was the reason that as, was as the, the reason movies. for the laser beams on top of the sharks in the original Austin Powers. Oh, okay. Every every animal deserves a warm meal. I, I mean, I'm old enough cool. to remember that. I don't expect you all to be. It's okay. I have no excuse. Okay. I, I, I have seen that film. Um, I. I have I have only vague memories of 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 the Austin Powers series. I'll be honest. <laughs> um, so okay. So surprisingly, they don't hold up well. Just saying. Uh, Just saying. Yeah, that's that's unsurprising, but yeah. In which in which philosophy club abruptly pivots to the um, cinematic merits of Austin Powers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, sorry about that. I, I yeah. want to like give opportunity for a response. Uh, yeah, and also like, Blake, you've been muted for for a bit. Do you yeah. have anything you've been stewing on? Um, does this? How's my mic? First of all, can you guys? Uh, hear sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, so thoughts on uh, where this separates animals from humans? Can animals have this? thought of this is what we're made of we're all made of the same thing it's all this energy can a dolphin think that can a tarantula think that or is that a uniquely human or is that like a certain threshold of animal or is that just our perspective and it's only a human perspective and dolphins have a completely different perspective of what is really happening yeah I, I, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the current sort of like understanding from, you know, all the, the biologists out there is that sort of self-aware animals aren't that level of self-aware, but Diana already brought up the point of like, there's sort of like language problems within that and, you know, our, you know, and, and epistemic difficulties in assessing that information. I will say this if they can like if dolphins can wonder like 
oh, well, what, 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 what am I really made of? What, what even really is a dolphin? That means that they have existential despair. And I mean, I don't, I don't know that that's good, bad, or indifferent, but now you sit there thinking about dolphins with existential dilemmas now. And I don't know, that's something. And, and, and yes, the dolphins are having existential dilemmas with lasers. Oh, absolutely. It has to be with lasers. Otherwise, what's the point? But I mean, <laughs> so I, th- I think it's part of the problem is we're looking at it from we're on top of the food chain. We're the biggest animal. We're th- this is solely our perspective. If there was something else, if there was um, if there were sharks with lasers, we'd be a step below. They'd be winning. And this may be how you solve this problem, to be honest with you. You may have to think about sharks with lasers and accept that we're not at that level. It would shift, like sincerely, it's like some, like something like to to like knock humans down on the on the food chain would shift our perspective. But then again, like modern ecologists don't talk about food chains, at least not for not to my knowledge. Like they talk about food webs because it it just doesn't proceed linearly in two directions. It, there's there's lots of animals eating lots of different other other um, animals and plants and stuff, uh, and some plants that eat animals, which is really cool. <laughs> Okay. But uh, even, even even in a web, there's a hierarchy. Like <clears throat> there are still animals at the top of the web uh, at which they are not being predated upon, and and they are definitely predatory towards the animals lower on the web. Like I get what you're saying. It's more intertwined than just a food chain, like straight up and down, but it's still a hierarchy, right? I used to I mean, think this about food. It, it used to be a pyramid, but now it's a plate and they just have little, you know, parts of it. And so I think it's really just how you think about it. That's true. They There's, did get rid of the food pyramid. It yeah. is now, it's now an egalitarian setup. That's right. So maybe everything's not so a hierarchy. It's the food Illuminati. Um, <laughs> the Illuminati. Okay. You know what, another, on, on like the topic of like, uh, you know, uh, ecology, I guess, biology or something. Um, I, I think something that, something that occurs to me is that, is it, would it be possible to reconcile a, a non-animal like understanding of human beings? And I emphasize here that like an animal understanding is not a particularly limited one, at least for, for me. And, I, and we can interrogate that more if you like, but like, is a is a is a non-animal understanding of humans reconcilable with the theory of evolution? This is the question. Like, can we believe in both at the same time? Can you say that again or elaborate a little bit? So, okay. theory of evolution. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, like, so here's it, my my case. Like to to uh, my case saying that no, we can't reconcile those things. Um, from which I would proceed to say that like evolution is is good enough as a theory that we should trust it over and above uh, our whatever like intuitions we have about humans. Before that step, can we reconcile the two? Um, I say no, just because it would bring to, it, it, it. I can't answer the question of where in the progression from our ancestors, our ancestor species, to modern day humans did we become non-animals or did we become more than animals? Did we acquire like the non-animal aspect? Um, I mean, it just seems like uh, evolutionarily speaking on this, on the, on the, on the, you know, we draw distinctions uh, based on species, right? But those distinctions are not hard line distinctions where in, you know, this ape has a child and this child is a human being. You know, uh, these are these are gradations that we uh, are are arbitrarily dividing up for like convenience, um, and and with the knowledge in mind that when we do that division, when we do that that compartmentalization or that like taxonomic classification, we are creating a system that is convenient but not totally reliable. You wouldn't want to like you wouldn't want to treat all like specimens that fall within the category of of Homo erectus 
the same way. You wouldn't want to assume that they all come, they all are of, that they all have the exact same physical properties because that's not what Homo erectus means. It's just a, a taxonomic, a taxonomic class uh, from which human, uh, which is understood to be like a precursor species to Homo sapiens sapiens, which is us. Um, but again, like this, uh, in, in strictly biological terms, evolution proceeds very gradually from one species to the other, such that when we do this dividing up, and therefore when we try to distinguish between the, the generation that is not the generation that is animal and the generation that is non-human, or rather the generation that is sorry animal and the generation that is human, we can't do that. We can't non-arbitrarily draw that line uh, again on the theory of evolution, which. I'm leaving to, uh, aside, <laughs> like litigating that, just because I've watched too much YouTube about that already. Um, so yeah, that's that's my argument. Like, we would have to, on the theory of evolution, we would have to find the generation that was the first one to be, you know, non-animal humans, and we can't do that. We would hate it, it, it's we can't then like take both theories to be true at the same time. Arguments against? I mean, I can take an initial stab if someone sort of wants to roll af afterwards. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's sort of like, it seems like if we had sort of a bird's eye view of history, we could sort of just find the first generation of primate or whatever else have you that sort of has self-reflection and the, the ability to recognize like hey that is me and you know that's that's at least sort of a, a good starting point and then from there that sort of self-reflection if that is useful you know it goes and expands and involves and improves and grows into the the creatures we know and love here human beings like that that seems that seems perfectly perfectly viable. Where you know where or why you know the first proto human went? Holy shit, that's me! What the fuck? I I mean I don't I don't know why or how that happened, but like I don't I don't need to for the theory to work. It did, and that person produced what? reproduced at a higher rate than other other people and creatures did, and I don't know would would. I, I guess that would be it. By the way, um, like, sorry for swearing. <laughs> Philosophy Club is rated R. I have a response to that, but I don't want to go on forever. Do we have um, anyone adding on to that or supporting me? I, I would be happy not to be alone. <laughs> I think it's really difficult to um, separate something into we're very smart animals um without taking um away the kind of uh what we get socially and that we may have only gotten for say the last ten thousand years um and comparing that with what we see in a very finite window and so we see a very small window when we look at koalas and giraffes and everything now I can imagine uh, a very smart giraffe looking at humans 50,000 years ago or whatever version of humans were at that point and saying, ah, that's not very smart. That's not a, you know, a, a complex creature or anything like that. Um, and essentially doing the same process now with us looking at uh, things that we consider, oh, uh, that's just an animal. I fear I couldn't hear it well enough to to probably okay. formulate a response. Uh, I think I think it, it, you're not coming in badly, just a little bit more quiet uh, than like my with my fan on the background and stuff. So I apologize for that. Um, do we have? Uh, uh, would anyone else like to like capitalize on it? Sorry, I'm, I'm I, I find I find myself like caught in the I, this is like meta commentary a little bit and I, I tend to hate that but um <laughs> my, I'm personally caught in, in, a, in a weird space here where I want to 
facilitate facilitate conversation and I have a thousand things to say and I want to like really profoundly disagree with stuff but not in the way that like makes the club bad and hostile um I, I because I think it's be really important that, the, that that discussions like this are had and that they are that they are not like the cause of like the breakdown of relations between people uh whose whose ideas are are, are absolutely like I mean, for lack of a, of a of a less cringy term, valid. <laughs> well, well, Diana yeah. has has unmuted herself, so yes, please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, first of all, like, quickly kind of like go back on the whole like equals MC squared thing about how. Um, it, well, it's interesting that we it could be seen as perhaps. Um, different stages of matter like you know you're talking about um water and whatnot um i just think that i would even that kind of like even pushed me back to think like um that i would go more towards that um uh, sort of an idealism idealism like point of view that you know nothing but our ideas and our consciousness and our mind exist, um, which is <laughs> different than what I said about the um, us being like partially um, materialist or um, and I think that the basic element uh, of reality or everything else really does come from the mind and depends upon its like operation of the mind. Um, but moving on to, um, about when we can really identify when we, um, perhaps became more conscious thinking beings, I don't really know when that would be. Um, and I would, I wouldn't know, um, when we can sort of draw that line of this is when we started becoming more, uh, cognitive thinking beings than just uh, animals. So I, I don't know where or how I would draw that distinction, but I'm more so now leaning a little bit towards more of that. It all just depends on our, um, uh, how all of this is just kind of like a projection of our own consciousness. There's been, as I understand it, sorry, uh, I'll say one of my many thousands of things. Uh, there, there's been a lot of work, uh, as uh, from from my understanding, uh, involving not objectivity, which I take to be like possible but maybe not achievable, um, at least epistemically speaking. I rather there's work being done um, to the to the effect of intersubjectivity, which is to say that like we can you know experience a thing and basically all experience have the same experience of it in some relevant way which then we may talk about in different uh, ways we may in, we may like take understandings away from those experiences differently but nevertheless we see you know uh, the ocean and we see and, and it's it has its apparent properties regardless of the observer um, that's not that I'm, I'm oversimplifying it there but like that's the idea like inter uh, it's it's not we don't have to you know confine considerations uh to just what is subjective and what is objective we can we can discover stuff that is intersubjective and that it's like just it's like uh, subjective but to the same effect in lots of different observers um, and make inferences based upon that which is like i don't know how we do experimental science i guess uh, so sorry i i, I interrupted though uh, yeah. Justin, you and, were unmuted. Yes. What? Uh, so I think the oh. thing that I wanted to respond to was that uh, I think there is a delineation that is readily available between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom when it comes to the ability to manipulate your environment um 
there are other animal species that make habitats for themselves, but not to the degree that we do. There are other animal species that manipulate tools, but not to the way that we do. There are other animal species that can recognize themselves in a mirror, but not really to the way that we can. Like there are a, th there's a small set of like differentiations between us and animals that when you combine all of them together, make it a pretty stark difference in my opinion between us and even the closest animal uh, in terms of intelligence. And I'm all right with that. Now, just to take it back to the Namor symposium that we just listened to like a couple of weeks ago, I think the more interesting aspect is what if an alien species were to put us in our place in the hierarchy of animals? Because I don't really think that there is a, a species on earth that makes us less than the top of the hierarchy. But, but, but I could very easily see something extraterrestrial doing that so i just wanted to throw that back out there kind of tie it back into something that we talked about you know in the last phil club meeting and you know just an alternative perspective on the animalism yeah. you you've added significantly to my many thousands of things um I, I will I will yeah. say one thing um, yeah. real real quick here, sort of lo logistically. Um, we we never actually fought. This club is supposed to meet for an hour. It has <laughs> never once in its entirety <laughs> only met for an hour. Um, but if other people do have things that they have to be doing, like we 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 can in fact wrap things up if other people have things that they want to be doing, or if you need to quietly skedaddle, we can in fact do that. That's that sort of logistical point there. Non-logistical point here. I I do kind of imagine my now my, myself now saying it's that like you know, like us on the other is like hey aliens you can't do that to us we're we're real people with moral agents and rights and the aliens just just kind of laughing at us. It's like uh... I mean what one of the interesting points that was brought up in that symposium was what if the aliens have some um concept of what makes a rational being a rational being that we don't have like some kind of extra extra kinetic or, or or telekinetic like mental abilities and that is what makes you a rational being in the like universal scheme of intelligence we're fucked i mean we ain't there yet I guess it's worth mentioning that, strictly speaking, we don't know that there even is extraterrestrial. I mean, we can we can guess that there is like extraterrestrial life. Just we know a little bit about like origin of life on Earth, and we can guess that uh, similar conditions could manifest themselves in other terrestrial planets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can guess that like other other life exists. We can even guess that like that life finds itself in a position to become intelligent in its various like e in its ecological roles and stuff over many, over, you know, the millions or billions of generations that it takes to do that. We don't, I, I think we're, we're um, uh, guessing maybe, I don't want to say like too much, but it, it is definitely like an inference and not, not like a known uh, truth that there is a higher, you know, pinnacle of intelligence or a hierarchy of intelligences that's just innate to the universe. Like, you know, again, like just on evolutionary theory, we we human beings, for all the complex crap we do, are just re like responding to our environments um, in a very protracted way. We can kind of see in the bird's eye. Um, so, like, maybe aliens could come and put us in our place, intelligence-wise. But like, 
it's 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 only a guess that that's even like a theoretical possibility. But that would, or, yeah. Sorry, uh, I think Danny, you were going to you were going to uh, uh, chime in, and I was I pressed on. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was just sneezing for now, but um, I I kind of also side with um, I think it was Justin um, that said, you know about some higher intelligence than us. And I wouldn't necessarily name us, name ourselves as top of the food chain because in my opinion, that sounds a little egotistical. Um, so just because we are not aware of another higher intelligence, I don't think that we should shun out the possibility of there being another, um, other that be et or whatever um something a uh, higher intelligence than us um i certainly do think that it's possible and it's highly likely actually i am in my opinion just because of how um many <laughs> galaxies we have in our um space that seems so infinite so so i i, I got a couple thoughts um one, I am, I think William had started to allude to this as well, but I am super skeptical that there is life uh, anywhere else in the universe that even comes close to our level of intelligence. I think the ridiculous amount of like coincidences that need to take place to allow for our life to exist. And what I'm saying in that is like, there are so many things that have happened in the biological scale of time that had to go right for evolution to get to where we are. Um, and then once we got to where we are, the concept that they brought up in the Nomor Symposium was the like fragile civilization theory that once you get to a certain level of intelligence that you're more likely to like snuff yourself out as a civilization than you are to flourish as a civilization um i i don't think it's egotistical to say that until we see otherwise that we are the pinnacle of evolution we have been able to manipulate our environment to a level that no other animal can even come close to and if that is not proof enough on our planet that we are the pinnacle i don't know what else is um i mean animals but 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 i am completely willing to admit that should an extraterrestrial intelligence make themselves known to us and they are more intelligent than us yo i get it like we are relatively young on the evolutionary scale of what we know to be the universe the universe is like 13 and a half billion years old we are a flicker of time in relevance to that i mean like even if you talk about the entire history of primates it is a flicker in time to the history of of that but so if there's another alien out there that's smarter than us i get it but until we see proof, I got to believe that the circumstances are so fucking unbelievably infinitesimally small. All of the luck that had to take place for the biological effects that led to our evolution. I don't know that all of those things happen just willy nilly everywhere in the universe. I don't know. Okay. I have a couple sort of thoughts. Um, to, to Blake's question in the chat, um, do you think we can confidently say that we are the most intelligent animal on earth? Like um, with, with perfect confidence? No, I'm not even terribly like, like with, with 95% confidence, you know, standard social scientific reason of air. I'm feeling pretty good, but sort of general confidence. Like, I, I feel 
I, I, I can say with, you know, pretty, at least a pretty high degree of com- of confidence, but certainly not, not a program for the, for the reasons sort of uh, alluded to, um, alluded to earlier with these sort of how do we measure that are our measurements inherently sort of biased towards us and our communication that sort of that that sort of thing but to to justin's point to justin's point then everyone anyone anyone jump in i just wanted to unmute myself because i noticed that at one point everyone else had their mic unmuted and i'm like oh i want to unmute my mac too um um but to to to, in response to justin's point is like is it sort of the argument though that the statistical like all the things that had to go right for life relatively like us to manifest isn't that um or isn't it argued that that sort of counteracted with the fact that the universe is so blooming big and thus there are so many blooming chances for that to happen i mean i am i am a philosopher and not a statistician. And that is where I will leave that. (laughs) (laughs) I have heard that argument as well, uh, just to, just to put it out there. Like, uh, so unlikely, but statistically speaking, sorry, I interrupted. (laughs) Uh, Just to kind of like piggyback on um, Daniel that I, I still kind of, stick to my guns a little bit that uh while yes it has not been made known to us in a way that we can understand yet that there could be another um higher or more intelligent being I still wouldn't uh I still wouldn't uh leave out the possibility that there very well could be another um, intelligent um, being in. So I couldn't say with perfect confidence either that we are the most intelligent um, animal either. I think on, on that point, it is very, I think, difficult, but philosophically, conceptually profitable to come to ask the question and, and make a big and make a big deal out of the question like what is intelligence what does it what does it mean what can it mean to be more intelligent than something else a really stock standard argument that i've heard about to, in this like realm of things uh is maybe ants are more intelligent than humans because unlike humans ants are very unlikely to destroy themselves with thermonuclear weapons <laughs> ants are very unlikely to pollute the planet to the point where they can barely survive within it and where they're causing mass extinction events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They accomplish a lot in terms of proliferation of the species. But if we're talking about like accomplishments and likely outcomes in terms of uh, you know, when we measure or talk about intelligence, when we conceptualize it, they seem to be significantly smarter and they're not the only ones. I said nematodes earlier, and that wasn't a joke. There are billions, billions more nematodes than there are human beings, um, and it's it's not just one species of nematodes, I don't think, but like it's a it's a it's a, 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 a you know small enough like taxonomic category uh, that the sheer number of them is 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 rather domineering. And if they were to disappear, this is about like the point of like interdependency and food webs and stuff. If nematodes were to disappear, most of our soil on Earth would be basically like agric- agriculturally worthless we would be gone in a couple of years. Um, and that's like, and that's talking full disappearance. It's not a likely outcome, but like measuring organisms, even like segmenting them from each other, measuring them against one another uh, is, is, is very difficult. We have to adopt like a standard through which to, to measure, like a, a, a metric, I guess. Um, and adopting that metric, adopting that standard seems to be kind of arbitrary right like yeah we we can we can conceptualize humans as the most intelligent in terms of the infrastructure we can build and the scale of that infrastructure but like why you know uh, dolphins do perfectly well without building pretty much anything um and so do most organisms uh plenty of organisms are are keystone species in their in their uh, ecological environments 
uh, and they don't expand beyond that environment, and they don't represent anywhere near a majority of the organisms in that environment, but we still call them like domineering predators, because for them, this is the, that, that niche, that role in their environment is the best strategy. It's the smartest play for like gray wolves is what I'm thinking of as, as like a keystone species uh, who thrive on being very few in number or relatively few in number. So yeah, sorry about that. But like, I, I, that's like what I wanna, I, I can't answer any of the questions I've just posed if I've posed any, any hard questions, but like, that's what I, what I want to like direct, I guess, maybe the audience as well to, <laughs> to, to, to come away thinking about what does it mean to be more intelligent than something else or someone else, as a matter of fact, we can, you know, social scientists have done, have, have, have done us a service by talking about things like emotional intelligence and different, different ways in which individual people are, can be measured differentially against one another. Um, and, and how it's just, I mean, there's a lot of, I think, appreciation in that field and, and by extension in like the circles I run in about the appreciation of, of the, I guess something like the innate beauty of that difference, right? Like different people see the world very differently and, and think different stuff about it. And we talk about some of that in terms of intelligence and relative capacity, some of it not, um, but it's just kind of cool that this is the case, that any of, that any of, that all this diversity exists at all. Um, but that's tangential, like, it, it, you know, the, the question I'm asking, I guess, is like, what does it mean to be more intelligent than something else? And how would we know, you know? I think your question kind of reminds me of um, a symposium from last week given by Carlos Mariscal, and he was talking about how um, we would go about to identifying life if we have this sort of conception of what life is, then how could we apply that to, you know, our scale in the, in our universe, right? Of like, we have this certain idea about what life is or what intelligence may be. How do then, how does that get then applied to the whole entire universe? Just because there could be, um, you know, a whole planet of, androids or robots and would we classify that as life um or that as intelligent um it's just really depends on like you said william about our conception of what um intelligence is and could be extended to what we classify life to be that was that was the n equals one problem right mm-hmm Okay, I was want to make sure I was remembering that right. The um the we're we're the only uh, we're we're the only you know species or the the Earthlings are the only you know place that where we've seen life definitively arise. So we have a sample size of one. So which features are essential features of life and which ones are accidental? Well, we don't know, and it just kind of depends on the theory you roll with. I'll I'll even add on to that. I've I've heard and. I don't actually, I, I talk a big game, but I don't actually know very much about science. Uh, so I've heard that silicon, silicone, silicon has uh, a like lot, it. a lot of the same properties as carbon. Ergo, there could be silicon based life. And we would more or less, we would recognize it as stuff that like metabolizes and grows and things. Um, but it wouldn't be molecularly comprehensible as like as, as life it wouldn't it wouldn't be taxonomically admittable um this is just, again it's a thing i've heard but like yeah it should kind of goes to show that the standards that we're using uh represents the fact that any that our sample size is one and and, and therefore our, our standards are kind of inevitably arbitrary that doesn't make them categorically wrong or anything but like they're forced to be arbitrary i guess because they're just relative to us and and we don't know of any like universal actual standards here unless there's disagreement on that issue um in which case i'm still committed to it but like we should hear those disagreements <laughs> all right i mean i think this is kind of getting to the point that i was trying to make earlier which is just that like we don't we don't even have one existing microbe outside of planet earth that we can consider living right now 
right? Like I would like, I would like to believe that the universe is in a massively huge place. There has to have been life somewhere else. But again, man, like I don't know how many of the things had to go right for us to get to where we are right now because I'm not a statistician, but I know the number is infinitesimally small. Like so many things had to go right for us to get to where we're at. I, I just don't know how, how even as big as the universe is, how frequent that is going to be in the universe. I, I just don't know. So I guess what I, and I I tried to bring this up to the professors is we are so concerned about intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. And I would just like to find dumb as fuck life somewhere else in the universe before I'm even remotely worried about finding intelligent life in the universe. I have a a hard time finding intelligent life in Alabama. I, I would I would like to find dumb life on Mars before I worry about intelligent life in the universe. Having, having been to Alabama, I, I have to, I have no choice, but to echo your, your sentiments, <laughs> Justin. Um, um, but, and I also echo your sentiments that like, if we find like an alien slug, like give me a month and I'll have a cult built around that alien slug. so now so now you're bringing up my actual like comments from the symposium last week which is great like i'm glad somebody was listening like that makes me happy (laughs) i think i would say like maybe um i would agree that yes we have come very far but you know we haven't had that much um space exploration um up i mean like the last time we like really did into like a nasa like apollo mission was like 1972 so uh i would say just kind of give it more time you know we are entering more into space exploration and we've seen what other uh you know billionaires (laughs) uh interest in in space exploration so um you know, like I said, I would just give it a little bit more time, see if what we find out there, whether it be intelligent or non-intelligent life. You do do, do y'all want to play a prank on William with me? Be, <laughs> um, because um, it. We, we, oh, okay, okay. When he gets back, we we the conversation is on capitalism and how great capitalism is. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we 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 go to this ju- just I will just stay silent because you know I can't pull that off. <laughs> he, he would never believe that for me in a million years. Come on now. <laughs> that's that's true. And th- this would work a whole lot better if, if Rex was with us. Rex, if you're listening, we miss you, buddy. We hope to see you around next time. Daniel, I think what you're saying oh, is right. that is, is, in is, general, like the corporate like, machine as it churns out people is probably a higher intelligent uh, being than humans themselves as they I, feed that machine I, I i mean i'm not i'm not sitting here praising the free market but it's objectively the most efficient and even if it fails in points of justice <laughs> from time to time it just it it, it, it not, nothing else works nothing else works i just don't think people really need weekends like i think that's a false construct I, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Go on, go on. So if we just did the same thing every (laughs) single day, it would be more consistent. It doesn't make sense to, you know, take any sort of time. It would be less straining on resources. You'd build habits quicker. You could get more done quicker. That's more product turned out, more profits to trickle down. I, I, fantastic. What do you think of the term live work? I... I can no longer continue this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should exploit any and everyone start working at the age of nine just <laughs> and uh, 
you know, there people why should we allow people to have enough free time to develop dangerous things like ideas? Yes. <laughs> this is all going in the bod. <laughs> Who needs <laughs> art? I don't I don't edit these. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I am aware of the prey. <laughs> I got back like a minute before <laughs> I turned the camera back on. Ah, uh, damn it. But that was very entertaining. <laughs> cool. I'm so happy to have been the center of attention. Uh, <laughs> can, can I bring something in that uh, may have already been brought in like while I was away because it doesn't take them. Uh, and, and, and like somebody possibly in this room is going to think is like, trite but something occurred to me while i was in the bathroom that sounds bad the the, <laughs> the relationship of like you know humans to non-humans seems on on like a, on, on a broad scale to re, uh, pretty deeply resemble the relation between like the capital class the capital owning class and the worker class roughly divided there's a whole stock of middle management that kind of blurs the line a little bit but eh, um in that when when you would talk about like class struggle it's really important to understand that there's a hierarchy at work right there is a relationship of like domination downward from from the uh from those who control who own the resources and those uh who need the resources and, and work for them right likewise there's a relationship of dominance that that we can pretty like pretty overwhelmingly see with regard to like humans and non-humans in nature we we take they are they are useful to us we we take and, and, and use them um and that it requires that we control them and that requires that we use things like like you know cattle prods and i don't know um selective breeding etc cetera, etc cetera. uh it's definitely a relationship of dominance downward but in both sets it is equally important to understand that there's a relationship of support upwards Again, if the nematodes died, so would we all. If uh, sharks were gone, that's a keystone predator out of the out of the eco uh, ecological loop. Uh, and also, they can never have lasers. But like more than that, uh, if 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 they were to if they were to disappear, uh, the 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 ocean's uh, ecological system would radically change. Especially if they disappeared very abruptly, like in the time scale upon, on which we could kill them if we wanted to. You know. Um, and that's, you know, sharks are a broad category of species, not just one species. That, you know, regardless. Um, so, so you're so saying... So at the same time as we, like, we dominate these other organisms, they, we also badly need them. And, and, and that kind of throws into question which one, which set of things is superior uh, in the same way. as like, I think that that holds true when we talk about, like, class struggle. It's which set of things is is more necessary um so, so you're yeah. saying that we need to give the little little microbes their 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 own lasers if we are to liberate the proletariat yes <laughs> you're saying we're not doing our part um our part like ecologically speaking we're, well, yeah, we're, we're not we're not like uh you know uh, enriching the soil with nitrogen and or sometimes we enrich it with too much nitrogen. And well, yes, it sometimes. runs off and creates other problems. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could be, I mean, oh. yeah. <laughs> In the same way that like bosses it's need fine. to, if, if if we're going to have a system of like bosses and workers, it's really important that the workers not be uh, exploited to the point where they can't do production, assuming like the company's goals are the right goals, which they are not. Um, but yeah, for the same reason, like it seems really, it's it's like ecologically very important that, that um, uh, organisms with more functional power in the system uh, use that power to the benefit of the organisms with less of that power in the system, um, just as, as, as a means of keeping everyone around and alive and stuff. Um, so I apologize for having gone on forever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, I don't know, we talk about like hierarchies of, of intelligence and stuff. Again, the relationship of, of the relationship that's, that's endemic to hierarchies, whether or not those hierarchies are just, uh, still implies that we depend on one another, that we, or at least there's some a relationship of like support upwards is what I'll, I'll continue to call it because I don't think that depends, that dependence runs the other way so much. Can we draw a comparison there to um, like English as a second language? 
um, and native English speakers in our how we're gauging intelligence? Does anyone else have another have a have a thought on that? Because what I'm thinking of is like the history of IQ tests and stuff. Uh, I, should, I, yeah. I I had the 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 same sort of sort of thing. IQ tests wind up being more reflective of knowledge of upper middle class white culture rather than rather than actual intelligence. Where do you where do you keep your and it's some outdated bougie ass word for couch that I can't think of that no one except for upper middle class white people and higher would have known what the hell to do with that. And that using as justifications that, you know, basically, you know, they're the smart ones. You're Davenport? That might be it. That might that, that, well, Justin that might said be, in chat. That might be it, Justin. I, I can't I can't rem remember it. Um that's as that's as good as any. Um yeah. They're definitely like my understanding personally about IQ tests is that they were initially invented as a way for teach for elementary schools and whatnot to gauge students that were struggling more in classes in way, you know, struggling maybe in ways that weren't directly obvious by things like test results, because maybe these schools are pre-K, they don't do test results. Um, if they could gauge like which students needed extra help, they could bring people more onto a level playing field later in later grades. And this was the initial idea and that was, and this was the first IQ test that was developed, and it was taken up by eugenicists after that development. It wasn't, it wasn't for those purposes. It didn't accomplish those ends until it was like retooled to be a, to be a tool of domination. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that's that's right. I I misspoke slightly. That's that's correct. No, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't like accusing anything, but like yeah. <laughs> um, no, oh, but I was pointing out my, my own sloppiness. That was that was careless wording on my part. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, I, I, I can say one more thing about like IQ tests at least. Um, just that when we talk, you know, it was it was intended as a way to to gauge which students needed extra help initially. And again, from the original inventor whose name I've forgotten, some French guy in the eighteen hundreds. What uh, this it wasn't. Uh, a a normative judgment about intelligence immediately. This wasn't this again. It was taken up and retooled as a way for to place people on a hierarchy uh, and then enforce that hierarchy through legislation, and and, and etc. Um, but it wasn't. It was initially in, uh, intended as a way to to help kids do better in school. That's help individuals accomplish more within the you know rules within the bounds of a particular set of activities. It wasn't a way of measuring intelligence per se. Um, at least, at least, it would be straightforward to conceptualize it as not a way of measuring intelligence per se, but measuring like aptitude for the kinds of things that they're asking of you to do in schools, um, and whether or not you would need extra help, like developing those aptitudes. Again, the idea as well was like development. Uh, so it's like, so yeah, like I don't know the the I. I, I struggle with IQ tests, man, but uh, that's just because of my eyes. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the thing that's like important about them, I, I, I hope to convey, I guess, is just that they, uh, they don't necessarily uh, uh, reveal a hierarchy of intelligence. They don't necessarily reveal the gradient as it truly is. They reveal a gradient, or at least, you know, a, a distribution curve of some kind. But it will be you know, about if the if the IQ test is measured, if is administrated well, in that it accounts for things like English as a second language students, uh, it will reveal like aptitude for schoolwork well over and above anything that we call like true intelligence, uh, as, as, as I understand it, which is that I don't understand intelligence or what it really is. But anyway. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> like I say, a thousand things to say at any given time. I guess the, the thing, the like, question to ask is, if we've discovered anything over the last little while of conversation, what does that something say about, in favor of or against animalism as a view?
I I think we have arrived at the conclusion that most philosophical discussions arrive at. Oh, don't say it. At, oh, no. <laughs> as complicated, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> it's got some good things. It's got some bad things. It, there, there are some strengths to it. There are some, some drawbacks. <laughs> yes, so, philosophers are the best. That's what we have arrived to, Justin. <laughs> Well, you said every philosophical philosophical conversation devolves to like that. Yeah, pretty much every like as I am going through uh, multiple philosophy classes right now, but one of them is ancient history of Phil. Um, pretty much every single philosopher in the ancient history of philosophy has a hard time not springing their arm, patting themselves on the back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, when, though whenever you cheerlead, you you run that risk. I I remember this is this is a random ass antidote. But um, when WWE was doing their first um all all women pay per view event, um, people were immediately joking that the most devastating injury of the night was going to be Stephanie McMahon breaking her arm, patting herself on the back for getting this together. And I would still argue it was Vince that would have been the one that was hurt. His you're, bruised ego. You're 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 not you're not wrong. She for for to to Stephanie McMahon's immense credit, um, she was actually in fact very minimally on screen and very humble on there. So everyone had to eat had had to eat crow there. At other times, was she maybe not not so much. Yeah, but, but, but Wait, not uh, that night. That hum- night, they humble, had humble and McMahon. I'm sorry, I'm just trying yeah. to like wrap my head around that it concept. Was, it, it, like, it was, we, can't, we can't do it. I'm, we can't talk about I'm, wrestling on the, on the I'm show. Gonna, I'm going <laughs> to need a lot more. I'm going to need a lot more drugs to do that. <laughs> like, sorry. And- it, it's like I, I'm I'm as mind blown as you are, Justin. But for that one pay per view event, it was a couple of quotes and some little like um little like pre-packaged thingamadoos they played between matches and that was it it was rather minimal i don't know D- diana this is your first meeting um wrestling somehow seems to always come up wrestling and smash mouth um my deepest apologies <laughs> and mine as well for failing to contain <laughs> the wrestling and smash mouth Oh, you, you can't, like, no one's expecting you to control this madness, William. Uh, In regards to animalism, I I would say (laughs) that it is complicated, uh, that I just, I'm I'm left with more questions um, about it, just because I feel now a little bit more drawn to um i said like a more idealist point of view that you know it's just more of a projection of our consciousness and even could extend it to say that matter is just an illusion um but that's just kind of where i'm at with my thoughts um i still don't think that we are animals and if we are not entirely um and it could all just be an illusion anyway (laughs) I can only apologize that, but like we didn't, we didn't delve into idealism because that is that is a fascinating like field of of ideas. Uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's Thank just you. to to just to go to show like the conversation need not end here. Uh, for you, for you, the viewer at home, like and subscribe. By the way, um, <laughs> yeah. but, but before before we do the sub plugs wrap up. Blake, smash, smash that like button. Sorry, and, and smash, smash that like, like button. that button. Smash Blake that like button. Blake wants you to smash the like button, don't you, Blake? Uh, might as well go walking on the sun. Exactly. Yeah. Superb. <laughs> ten out of ten, Blake. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, like, summary thoughts on animalism. I think we are animals, um, but I do agree that. Yeah, there seems to be something there that the thinking thing is a little bit different than the animal part of me. All right. 
we'll take, we'll take like any other closing statements? Okay. I, I still think, and, and I'm willing to admit that there are a lot of, of animal intelligences out there that we are not entirely aware of just how complex they are. I still feel like the delineation is made with how much humanity has been able to manipulate its environment to meet its needs. Um, there are animal species that make nests and mounds and dig caves and tunnels and whatnot, but no other animal species makes drones. No other animal species makes cooling and heating systems to adjust their environment to the, the way that we do. I do think that we are a certain pinnacle of evolution on this planet, but I am completely willing to admit that we are only the pinnacle of this planet's evolution, not evolution as it could exist elsewhere in the universe. However, I would like to see any evolution elsewhere in the universe before I'm willing to completely just throw it out there that, you know, intelligent life exists beyond this planet. All right. Um, and I'm personally, uh, um, my, I, I am myself very much committed to uh, uh, animalism as a, a sort of like a trivial truth on on my general view, which is which is you know material and scientific and all that all that all that good stuff. Um, in that, yeah, it, it, I, I guess I'll, I'll have to leave it at that. <laughs> I can't I can't not ramble. Um, but if we have any, uh, I'll I'll, I'll uh, invite any closing remarks at the end here. But let me let me close. Uh, do the do the introductions, I guess. Um, we hope that by next week we'll be we will have uh, Professor Gary Miriam uh, on the use and abuse of thought experiments, uh, which will be his own his own work. And I think I, I take from discussion it's also to be his own like personal interest, um, yeah. which is which would be really cool. I, I said it in the announcement. I think it is true. This is going to be one of those times we get to see what your professor really thinks about something. You know, and how rare is that? And if um, it's not, if it's not yeah. next week, it'll be the week after. He wants to give this presentation before the end of the semester, and there's just there's only so many weeks of that. Yes, and and and, and indeed, um, on the, on the note of like the end of the semester, to those who are in the room and to those who are, who may be watching later, uh, good luck with with finals and all that stuff. Uh, I'm sure for for many of us watching, it's mostly essays. Um, Good luck on those. Start early. <laughs> so I'll say, <laughs> don't be like me, and do improvised philosophy exclusively. Um, okay. Uh, I, 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 I'll re-echo what I said earlier: is, is don't let the discussion end here. I think animalism um, and 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 corollary uh, philosophical ideas are 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 in, uh, fascinating and useful to be uh, talking about because, on my view, come away from those arguments with better ameliorative understandings of things that then cascade into better policy which helps us materially um which we can track uh so yeah please you know do that work i want to I, I don't want to uh, i don't know it, when people disagree i hope they just you know disagree in good faith um and don't let don't let that the fact of there being like discourse uh discourage you from from engaging with that discourse so thank you uh those of you who are here and those of you who are watching later uh, this was this this was this was <laughs> This was fun stuff. I got pranked. Um, yes, and, yes, you did. And we like for the prank alone, if nothing else. If you hated this entire conversation, but you liked the prank, like the video, because the yeah. prank is what matters in the end. Yeah. <laughs> not to not to undercut everything that you just said, William, <laughs> but kind of wound up doing that, didn't I? Anyway, I'm gonna stop talking now. Bye.